Good morning here from Ireland and good evening here to you, uh, Chris. Um, really thanks for joining me this evening. I'm really delighted that you're giving your voice to the Inclusion Dialogue podcast and I'm really looking forward to our chat. Um, do you mind if I ask you just, just to start things off? Um, how are you working in the space? And maybe if you could go into your early career. So how did you get involved in this in the first place? Hi, Joanne. Yes, I'm in Western Australia. It's uh, early evening here and the weather is glorious. I know it's a bit cold over there, but uh, it's beautifully warm over here. Um, I trained as a teacher back in the, oh, a long time ago now, back in the late 60s. And when I trained, I trained um, across primary and secondary. It was a new course that was out. And I was down in Southampton and doing my um, training prac on the Isle of Wight, which was wow. fabulous. Mm. When we qualified in England, we were able to select one or two districts that we wanted to go to, but then the government allocated you to a school. So I had selected London and the London Borough of Brent, and I got allocated to a primary school in a very low socioeconomic area. Mm -hmm. And at that stage, London was just opening up to um, international families coming in as migrants. Yes. And we had a lot of West Indies coming in. So our school was one of the few schools that had West Indian children in them. So that was quite an experience I had, and I always tell my students this, I had 50 students in the class, and we all sat in long desks next uh, to each other, the ones with the big pop-up tops, yeah. with a little inkwell in the corner, <laughs> and I was allocated on day one, I had a big desk out the front which you stepped up to, and on my desk there was the cane and one piece of chalk. And when that chalk was used right down to nothing, I was allowed to ask for another piece. Wow. The two children had inkwells and you had an inkwell monitor. And, oh, my goodness, what a mess that used to be. Mm. So we talk about special education, but at that stage, the variety of needs of the children in the classroom that I have was huge. And mm. um, we had no support. There was no additional staff involved. There was no training as a, as a new teacher. You literally went in the classroom and, and did what you like. I'll tell you one funny thing, not really to do with special needs, but it's funny anyway. Um, I wanted to do science. And I decided we would dissect some fish because it was something exciting to do, motivating <laughs> for the children. Well, the stink down the corridor, oh, you can my. imagine, can't you? That would, didn't go down well. So I learned over the years to just be a little bit more um, thoughtful of other colleagues in school. <laughs> so from that early beginning where I got to see a whole range of cultural issues and inclusion from a cultural perspective was very challenging mm. because the local people did not want these new West Indians coming into mm. their area and there was very much a divide between the two. Now, in the classrooms, of course, there was no room for divide. You were all mixed in together, but the children mm. accepted it, but it was the parents that didn't. So that was my first real mm. exposure to diversity, I suppose. Did you feel um, in any way equipped or? Oh, gosh, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, as a new, as a new teacher. Yeah. Uh, and. Although the training I went through was different to what students get now. It was a full-time course, and it was full-time. We were in classes or lectures or working with tutors from 8.30 in the morning till 5 every single day. Wow. There was no time to go off and work at Hungry Jack's or McDonald's mm. or, or to do another <laughs> job. So in that respect, we did have a lot of hands-on practical activities for teaching so in a way we were more prepared for the skills of teaching what yes. we didn't have though was an understanding of the difference in kids you know there's your class they're all the same you all read the same book and you mm. were all on the same page and you were all expected to write exactly the same uh, work on your notepad um, so the, there was no consideration at all for difference within a regular classroom so yeah that was quite different but I did and, have lots of good practical skills, though, which was great. Yeah. And did that then, did that trigger your interest in pursuing something further to kind of manage that level of diversity that you're experiencing? Did you, is that what made you go on and do more? No, no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, oh, my goodness, when I finished my, my year, which was your probationary year and qualified as a teacher, we then decided to go overseas. I was married at the time. We went to Zambia in Africa. Oh. 
And that was another diverse uh, Mm -hmm. look at life. Um, The children there were very weak, very low. Only my husband could get a contract because women weren't allowed to get contracts unless they were single and going on their own. Mm -hmm. So I was employed locally. And the other teachers in the school were most of the wives of the expats who were out there. So they had no qualifications whatsoever. That was interesting. I really enjoyed that. We were there for three years. And then at the end of it, we decided everybody was either going to Australia or to Canada. I wasn't going back to England. I'd had enough of England. (laughs) Cold, wet, miserable. Sorry about that. (laughs) Yeah, we're in it now. (laughs) Not many opportunities in London particularly. Mm. So we went to Australia. Now, this is where I got into special education. When I arrived in Australia, I had no... um, Australian background. So it was extremely difficult to get a job uh, teaching in a school. Mm. And the only schools that would offer me a job were guess, special schools. So I was zapped up in the special schools and I gradually realized, well, actually, I I quite like this. This is something Mm. that appeals to me, this supporting kids who are seen as different, special. And as Sally was saying in hers, as soon as a child had a slight uh, disability, they were put into a special school. So the range of abilities in there was really quite large. Mm. And at that stage, many children with high and profound support needs were still not in schools at all, all. completely Mm. excluded. Mm. So that's sort of what got me into special ed. And then I went on to um, head up uh, a kindergarten. I wasn't kindergarten trained, but head up as a principal of a kindergarten at no. the Spastic Society. Spastic wow. Society. Haven't we changed terms? Mm, mm, now, nowadays, absolutely. all these terms are just not acceptable. Mm. But at the time, that was what we used. So that really got me into special yeah. education. And so, once so, you get into it, you get hooked. <laughs> absolutely. And what did you do next? What did you do? Well, eventually we ended up going back to England for a couple of years and um, then we decided, no, it really wasn't what we wanted. We came back to Perth in Western Australia. And again, same problems, couldn't get into a regular school because at that stage teaching in Australia to to get a permanent job or to get a job where you wanted, you had to have done what was called country practice. Now, country practice was two years wherever they wanted to send you. Well, I got a young family of three kids, a husband who was working in Perth. I couldn't go out bush. Mm -hmm. So I ended up not being able to get a permanent job for probably about 10 years before I actually was able to get a local job. And again, it was the women that were the ones who were doing contract work. Mm -hmm. So contracts I was offered were in special schools again because I'd got some background into it. But I'd have to say by this stage, I really enjoyed working Mm. in the special schools. It was working with the more challenging students and everyone there was really nice towards Mm. them. It wasn't patronising like Mm. I found later on when I was working in Asia. Um, People were very sensitive to their needs and we did a lot of really good things. It wasn't academic. But we did a lot of practical um, things and a lot in the community, which was sort of the focus at the time. Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And do you see, did you think that at the time that Australia had a more, was it more proactive, more progressive in that area? Or were you able to do a comparison with maybe what was going on in England? Well, coming from Africa, Africa, there's no difference at all. Africa wasn't even thinking about it. If you couldn't get to school and you couldn't, blend in with everybody else there was no school for you there were no special schools there was no options available thinking back to my English experience and reading all the research that was coming out it was really being led by um, huge reports in England and new policy developments and the whole role of the SENCO that was coming into place which we didn't have in Australia for probably about another 10 or 15 years after you so here we tended to be following what was going on in England as a sort of progressive move towards what was originally integration and then became more inclusion. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned Asia. Would you mind telling our listeners just a little bit about your work there and what what experience? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll quickly fill in the 20 years in between. (laughs) Uh, In the um, 1990s, I uh, The school I was working in was a language development centre. It was a special school for children with delayed and disordered language, which was lovely. It was on the side of a regular school, but lo and behold, our children were not allowed to mix at all with students in the regular school. And 
the principal's position became vacant and I'd been there for about six years and I was the most qualified and probably the most capable in that particular area, but I wasn't allowed to apply because I didn't have a degree. Now, when I studied, there weren't education degrees. You, you did your teacher training and that was it. So mm. I, not to be put off, I've never been put off with things, went back to university and went on and did a doctorate degree and then decided that I thought I could contribute probably my years of experience and, and broad knowledge by training teachers. So I did that until 2000. And then in about 2005, I went on a six-month um, secondment to uh, Hong Kong, working at the university there, and I really liked that. I liked it for a number of reasons. One, because they really weren't doing inclusion at all. Two, because there were so many needy children there who were unable to access any realistic education. And three, because it was such an opportunity. I mean, who wouldn't want to go and spend all that time in, yeah. in Hong Kong? Beautifully situated and um, a really lovely place to be. And I tended to live local rather than expat. So mm. it was affordable because it was very expensive if you were one of the expats living in the expat environment. Now, that provided a huge opportunity for me to start to gradually lead into the philosophy of inclusive education mm. in, in, in Hong Kong and across Asia. And of course, to travel all around Asia to all the different countries and see what was happening there. Mm. So it gave me a huge insight to a different cultural uh, understanding when we're talking about inclusive education. And there's a couple of things I'll, uh, I thought I might share with you there mm, about mm. that because there's some quite considerable differences between the way they perceive inclusion and the way it tends to be perceived else, elsewhere. Yeah. Um, so there's an, first of all, the understanding of what we mean by inclusion. There's a huge variety there. They, they were starting to use the term an integrated approach to inclusive education. It doesn't really work, does it? Because mm. they're two different types of things. Yeah. But that's exactly what they were doing and it's exactly what they're still doing. But they would refer to inclusion as any form of education where a child with a disability was receiving education either in the regular school or in a special class within the regular okay. school. Yeah. So... And every country I went to around there had a different interpretation and understanding of inclusion. Basically, if a child was included in a regular school, they were called the inclusion child. So no, no notice here about the fact they were just another child in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they could only be included if they were able to cope with the work that was being done in the classroom. Now, teachers across Asia, they're employed based on their ability for their, to get their students to pass their exams. Okay. So students need to do well. Otherwise, the teacher's blamed. Mm -hmm. And if the teacher is blamed, then they can often lose their job at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And when I went there, there was a five-level hierarchy of schools. So number one was the best, two, three, four, five. And students were put into the school according to their ability. Now, <clears throat> when I went through school millions of years ago, we were rated as well. There was A, B, C, D, E, and yes. depending on your ability, you were put in that level. So they were still following that model, Gosh. but they were mm. doing it at a whole school level. And so once you got into one school, there was no way you were going to get any better you could mm -hmm. get worse, but you couldn't get any better. After I'd arrived, they reduced those five levels to just three. And they thought this was the bee's knees of moving education forward, that there were now only three types of Tears, hierarchical yeah. mm. schools. Well, you can imagine what happens with that, can't you? Mm -hmm. The number one schools get the number one students. The number one schools get the best teachers the number one schools get the best equipment the number one schools get the best facilities so you're putting students in a school where they're given every opportunity to do well and yeah. the less capable they are the less opportunities they're given and the lower the expectations so when we're talking inclusion there were no children with any special needs in level one 
none in level two, but they all ended up in level three, three. if mm. they were included. So quite a different perspective and understanding of what is inclusive education, I think. And can I ask, when was that? And you mentioned there that you don't think it's changed a huge amount. No, I went in 2005 and I came back in 2015. Okay. And then I've been, well, until COVID hit, backwards and forwards over the last five years. Mm. They certainly are doing a lot more training of teachers about inclusive education and teachers know the term and they talk about inclusive education much more than they ever did but the expectation is still there that the students have to do the same curriculum now they will modify that curriculum and they will help the students as much as they can one of the common ways of doing this is to give them extra classes after school Mm. so you've got the weaker students who are not coping in the classroom The teacher gives their own time. The teachers are very supportive. They give their own time to give extra classes to the student. So the student who's having a battle in school is there for the whole school day, then for this additional time afterwards, doing the same curriculum which they haven't picked up in the regular class, Um, Yeah, but being push, 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 push to actually pass it. Then when they go home, Homework is a huge issue across Asian schools. And when they go home, they've got their regular homework from the class, which they still haven't done. They've got additional homework, which they've been given from this additional class they've been doing. And, of course, for these children, it takes them probably two or three times longer to do it anyway. And then in addition to this, the parents are often paying for tutoring. So they go off to tutors. And it's not uncommon for children to still be awake at 11 o'clock at night still being expected to finish their homework and all the work that's required for school. That's unbelievable, really, isn't it, when you describe it like that? Oh, your heart goes out to these poor kids. And and the weaker the kids, the more challenging it is because the more they they have to do all of these things on top of it. But the whole, um, this whole tutoring thing is a big issue in, in, across Asia because parents want their kids to do the best they can and it's become expected that they will send their kids for maths tutoring, language mm. tutoring, and then music and art and heaps of other things as well. And you see them on the train set and the kids are asleep the whole time on the train trying mm. to catch a few minutes sleep because the transport is, is quite challenging. As you can imagine, it's very busy. Mm. Mm. See, a small little country, millions of people. Mm. Um, and the same in China as well. They often have to leave home at six in the morning. So you imagine going to bed 11, 12 at night, getting up, leaving at six in the morning. It's exhausting. So that's another huge issue, which I think they have to cope with, which you tend not to get here. Our kids here are much more spoiled, I think. (laughs) Yeah, well, when you put it like that, they certainly are. But in terms of their outcomes then for the students in the, the grade three school system that you described, Uh, And presumably even within that, there's a huge variability amongst the students in terms of their outcomes. Absolutely. So what what are their outcomes, particularly for students, say, with intellectual disabilities or, you know, is there research um, kind of capturing the, the experiences of those children in those schools? Well, like you, Mish, was saying in his, there's very little research internationally that actually listens to the children. Mm. We did quite a bit, well, not quite a bit, we did some research over there looking at um, where children felt comfortable in their school. We were trying to get an understanding from the kids with um, special needs who were in a regular school. Oh, bear in Mm. mind, they've only ever got mild disabilities, by the way. Anything more than mild, you're not there. Not a chance Mm. of getting into a school. Mm. So when we're talking inclusion in Australia, where we have all children are able to be included if the parents mm. want them there. High and profound support needs can be included because they have different outcome expectations. But across Asia, the expectations are the same as their peers. They have to pass the same exams. They might be given a little bit extra time and they have to do the same curriculum. Might be slightly modified, but basically if you can't achieve that, then you're not going to be in the class. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You um. You, you mentioned COVID and uh, the impact that's had on students, all students and students with additional needs as well. Um, and before we press record on this, Chris, you mentioned uh, a VUCA um, and that maybe you talk a little bit about that for our listeners, because like, I think maybe they might be interested in that. 
Yeah, well, we love acronyms, don't we, in special ed? <laughs> <laughs> and I came across this one. Um, I was doing an online um, workshop with um, the Philippines uh, a month or so ago, and they started talking about VUCA. And I said, I'm sorry, what's VUCA? Mm. <laughs> V-U-C-A. Well, and I thought it was rather nice, actually. They were talking about they tried to summarize what's been happening since um, we've had the COVID-19. And they use these four terms. The first one is volatile. The education has become very volatile. The mm. second one, uncertain. Mm. The third one, complex. And the fourth one, ambiguous. So I thought that was quite interesting, actually. So I sort of took that as my lead in um, to try and take that from the perspective of an international focus. How mm. could this be enacted across everyone when we talk about it. So I tried to come to a very simple understanding of what was meant by those four areas. So the, for the volatility, it would seem to me that the schools are in a constant state of change. Now, they're always in a state of change. Yeah. But the last two years has been so dramatic. Um, it's been the same for you, in and out of lockdown, totally. in and out of online learning, in and out of a whole range of different things. And in Australia, because we've got all these states and territories and every state and territory is individual regarding education, we're responsible for our own education. Yep. We have some federal overview, but we're responsible for our own. So the differences between states is enormous as well. Mm. So when we're talking schools are in a constant state of change, I think this has been elevated to an enormous level. Mm. And that, that is really the volatility of what's happening at the moment. Now, for the uncertainty, I would see this as unprecedented and unpredictable times. We still don't know what's happening. WA is still seen as the closed state. We still okay. don't know when we're going to open up for international travel. We don't know when students are going to be sent home because we've suddenly got cases of COVID in the school. It's mm -hmm. very unpredictable. So people who are trying to get back to the new normal, as we're calling it, mm -hmm. are still not able to really plan much ahead, which mm -hmm. schools don't like. Mm -hmm. Principals and teachers like to have that year's plan out. They like to know exactly what they're doing and how they're going to achieve the outcomes they want. And then complexity, and I think this is broader than just COVID. Certainly I'll comment on something in Australia that we're seeing a lot of, which you may be getting in Ireland, um, and I know you've been getting it in the UK, but I haven't heard much about it. And this is the increase in diversity and different types of student needs. And aligned with this is the expectation for teachers. One area we are seeing a lot of um, challenges in at the moment, and particularly we have quite a large independent and Catholic systems in all of our states and territories, mm -hmm. and particularly in those, is the number of students now who are presenting with severe emotional and behavioural disorders. Mm -hmm. Now, COVID has brought out a lot of mental health issues, yeah. and that's in the news all the time now. Mm. But before those came to light, this whole issue of children with severe behavioural issues, those who are highly disenfranchised with school, mm. those who go to school and cause enormous problems, they have been a big issue for probably about the last five years yeah. and has been increasing a couple of years ago. So schools have been saying and systems have been saying, what do we do with these students? Mm. We can't mm. have them in school because they are just too dangerous for the other mm. students that are there. Mm. What are we going to do with them? So what are we seeing now? Well, we've been working over the last probably 10 years to gradually close down special schools yeah. and move our students with disabilities more and more into regular schools, mm -hmm. either within the regular classes or within support centres or other means in in the regular school system. Yeah. But now we are seeing a movement the other way of, well, we're having to take these children with behavioural issues, or if they're disenfranchised, they won't go to school anyway, have to find alternative places for them. So mm. now we've got a whole range of new special schools emerging, and these have lovely names, things like care schools. Nice. Um, drop-in schools, um, there are a whole range of different terms which doesn't call it a special school. It's not seen as a special school. Mm. But basically, it's the same as what we had when we had full excursion. So yeah. I think 
this diversity of student needs is a huge issue. And if we don't come to terms with this really quickly, we're going to ha- end up with a different type of That's special education. Mm, mm. Are, you, are you seeing that in Ireland? So the only thing, just when you were talking there, before COVID hit, there was anecdotal um kind of talk about increasing number of students being at home as in not attending school so that that homeschooling um and just students being at home was on the rise um and uh, lord knows what's happened then since march 2020 in that area Mm. that there was students not attending were they at home because parents were choosing to homeschool or because they refused to go to school or because they were excluded from school we, we don't know that. Big difference. So, um, yeah, th- we don't know that. Oh, don't there's your right next down. piece of research. Yeah, next piece totally. of research. I know. I've been banging we'll the drum get this together for a while. On that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's a real um, forgotten piece now because COVID has hit. So the focus is on just the general population being at home and remote learning, which is great. But uh, I think there's a there's a there's a cohort of students that are either on short school days, perhaps, or they're uh, excluded from school, or they're simply at home and refusing to go in themselves. Yeah. And there's yeah. the we do have traditional homeschool. Ch- I say we do have homeschooling here as well. Yeah, but of course, because people have been thrown into it, a lot more parents, I think, are reconsidering that as an yeah. option, particularly if they have a child with autism. Yeah, who finds it very emotionally draining being included in a regular class. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it'd be interesting to see what research is produced on that. We have, we have one more letter in your in your acronym, uh, Chris. I know ambiguity. Yes. Now, to me, that's defining and enabling equity for all students, and it's an mm. ambiguous thing. How do we do it? What do we mean by equity? Mm. Everyone has a different understanding of the term equity, mm. and and how we're able to actually do this. So, a, a couple of outcomes from that VUCA, um, I put together some some ways of thinking about, well, how do we move forward with this and um, how can we make this better? Mm. Uh, And where are we at the moment? So if we look at the volatility, we've got things which are constant. So regardless of how volatile education is, there are things which are constant and these Mm -hmm. aren't going to change no matter what. We've got kids. Yep. Okay. We've got lots and lots of kids. We have to provide them with education. Lots and lots of education. And we have to make sure that they're able to learn. So we've yes. got three things, regardless of, of the whole of the volatility, that we mm. have to address. Looking at the uncertainty, we've got a number of certain things here. Well, the most important thing is that teachers are going to be responsible, whether mm. it's face-to-face, whether it's online, mm. whether it's in some other method which we haven't even thought about yet. Yep. Teachers yep. will be responsible. There's always going to be a lack of funds. We can never get enough money for what we really want to do. Mm -hmm. And there's an enormous variation in support, particularly for children who are working at home. What support are they going to get Mm -hmm. compared with those who are working face to face in a classroom where you've got education assistants running around, occupational therapists, speech therapists, lots of actual physical support. And then you've got insufficient training. All these teachers who've been thrown into online teaching Mm. they've had no training no it's you know guess what next week you're going to be teaching online whoa (laughs) yippee do how are we going to cope with that you know we need to go back and and i know you mentioned his talk was talking about we need to raise the status of teacher education we've been saying this for donkey's years Mm. but we need now to think ahead Mm. it's no good just training our teachers to be face-to-face teachers it needs to go into the curriculum now how are we going to teach in different modes? Yeah. And when we're thinking of the, the complexity, well, let's think of the opposite of that. What, what is simple? What is the simple things that we need to do? Well, we need to engage students. Mm. doesn't matter how we do it, but we need to engage students. We need to give them a sense of belonging. And this yeah. is really hard when you're working from home, particularly mm. with a child with special needs, mm. particularly a child with emotional needs, particularly a disenfranchised student. How do you make them belong Connect to the them. group? Mm-hmm. We need to develop a sense of rapport with the students. Some people are very good online. They can bring a student in and get them sitting at the computer and have them engaged in whatever's happening. But some people are really poor at that. Mm-hmm. And the very staid academic style teachers tend to be the ones in the most challenging, Strong find there. that most challenging trying mm-hmm. to get them in. And then we need to consider what support 
is going to be available for these children to help them learn their education. Yeah. And then the last one, very quickly, what's unambiguous? Well, we have to teach a curriculum. Yeah. You know, it's going to change. Yeah. We have to do it through pedagogy. That is definitely going to change. And most importantly, schooling will change. What would it be like in 20 years? Well, yeah. the physical school may not even be there. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. But certainly I think COVID is going to impact very much on the way people think about what we mean by schooling. Yeah. Um, I hadn't heard of it and I like it. So thanks for going through it. With, uh, yes, yeah, so I thought it was a really good one, actually. Yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. Um, Chris, I'm not going to keep you a huge amount of time longer, but I'd love to just close with your thoughts on uh, like, where do we go from here? What would you see the the future looking like in terms of in special and inclusive ed um, based on your years of experience? OK, put on my um, my <laughs> hat and my look in my ball and see what's <laughs> going to happen. <Yeah>. Well, <laughs> um, Using that VUCA as a starting point, I think we need to remain very cognizant of this. This is going to continue. These four issues are going to continue, and we need to upfront address them. Certainly in the less developed countries, we need to still work on improving teachers and leaders and systems, knowledge and understanding of inclusive education. Yeah. No, you're never going to get enough of that. Even schools here, the principals say, well, you know, we're doing so much, but we're not really 100% sure we've got it right. You know, mm. we need to do a little bit more about it. I think there needs to be much greater reliability on leaders in schools. So many of them can opt out and they give the role of the, the supporting the children with special needs who are included in their schools, they give that to the learning support coordinator yeah, or yeah. they give it to the deputy so, head yeah, or, yeah. you know, they give it to, to somebody else mm. other than taking that responsibility themselves. Mm. One of the big issues we have here, may not be the same for you, but certainly in Australia, is this divide between urban and rural education. I mean, we have got people thousands of miles away in tiny little communities mm. trying to achieve the same outcomes as our students in big urban cities. Yeah. And the support out there is really hard to get. Mm. Now, using online has made it a lot better for them, but it's still a big divide, and I think we need to keep focusing on that. Yeah. Mm. We need to monitor student outcomes much closer. Mm. What are we trying to achieve with the outcomes? Are the outcomes that we've selected appropriate? Mm. In many instances, they're not. Mm. There's a big push here for many more practical skills so that students are prepared for going into something they can do in the workforce yeah. rather than sitting at home and not being able to be employed. Um, of course, better quality and better trained teachers. Yes. I thought but you'd along say with that, that, yes. <laughs> yeah. Along with that, we need better trained teacher educators. Mm. So many teacher educators don't have a background in inclusive education mm. and they're required to teach courses on inclusive education. Yeah. And that in itself is a big issue. Mm. Um, we've got a whole range of contextual and cultural implications that in every system we need to consider. And there's mm. something we haven't we haven't talked about, but I know you may have spoke a little bit about it. Something I'm very passionate about, and we've done a lot of work in this area, is how do schools know when they're getting better at yeah. inclusive education? You know, what methods can you use for measuring progress towards inclusive education? And if we don't measure it, then we're really not doing the right thing because we need to know that we're getting better and we need to know that what we're doing is working. Yeah, um, I think that's a lovely way to, to finish our chat. And I think the measurement piece is huge. And I, I know you, you mentioned it now, Umesh mentioned it in his podcast as well. Um, and I think schools and principals, school leaders need a steer as to, as you said, how do they know they're getting it right? If they are getting it right, you know. And they need to be made more accountable by providing yeah. data and evidence that yeah. demonstrates, oh, we're an inclusive school. I've heard that so many times. Yeah, well, show me the evidence. Um, yeah. We just know we are. <laughs> mm, I know, <laughs> I know. Good enough. Chris, is there anywhere you want to send listeners to find out more about your work? Is there anywhere? Do you have a bio or a website or anything like that or a publication? I use, just I use link, LinkedIn. Yep. LinkedIn. Everybody knows LinkedIn. And ResearchGate. If you go to ResearchGate and you want to get any articles from anyone, if they're in 
registered in ResearchGate, the articles are all there and you just have to flip a quick um, message through ResearchGate and they will then, it will go to the, uh, the author and then we get a request and then we can just flip it straight back to them. So it's a, and if you haven't got access through your own yeah. library, it's a very easy way of getting free. Um, access yeah. to, to free yeah. articles direct from the author. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Chris, and, and watch out for our transitions book. We've got a new yes. transitions book coming out early next year. It's all on different aspects of transitions for students with special needs through regular school systems. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Chris. Thanks a lot. Lovely to chat with you. And you. Thank you.